Hello, my name is Lauren Hendricks. Today's date is March 24th, 2017, and I am interviewing Dr. Linda Wilson on the Ball State campus as part of the Ball State University African American Alumni Oral History Project. Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for asking me. Let's start with your childhood. Could you tell me when and where you were born? I was born in Louisville, Kentucky in 1950. And my parents lived in Stanford, Kentucky, because there was no hospitals at that particular location, small town. And so we came to Louisville. I was born, and then we came back to Stanford. My father was a teacher, and we lived right next door to the school. The schools at that particular time were segregated, so the school was freshman, first grade through 12th grade. And my father taught agriculture, and my mother had been a teacher, but as I have explained to you, at that particular time, women could not teach and be married, let alone have children. So my mother was a stay-at-home person. What were your parents' names? My father was Robert Leon Wilson, and he usually went by Leon. And my mother's name was Louise Rudder Wilson. She was from Paducah, Kentucky. My dad was from Jeffersontown, Kentucky. And they met at Kentucky State College, and they both married, uh, thought about being married at that time, but the war took place, and so they did not marry until after World War II was over. And my dad was stationed in Liberia. And what were your parents like? Could you tell me about them? I'm not sure what you mean by what were they like. Uh, like, what do you remember them as when you think of your mom and dad? Like, mom and what dad. Kind of, what kind of person were they? Were they, like, what were their personalities? Were they really? Well, my parents married late. So my mom was 32 when I was born. I had two sisters that were born subsequently. And um, they were, big on education. In fact, everyone in my family was big on education. Um, we spent a lot of time visiting individuals who taught school with my dad. They had no children, so we just enjoyed their time. And um, since he was in agriculture, he typically would visit and we would go with him, individuals who were sharecroppers or individuals who were farmers. And there were several large African-American farms in the Stanford area. And so typically, we went and did things when they went. And uh, since there were no televisions, uh, we would typically go to Mrs. Woods in her husband's house on Sunday and watched Shirley Temple, which was up the road, and then we would come back. And um, my dad was the baby of the family. My mother was the oldest of the family. And my dad's father was the butler and my grandmother was the cook for Henry Watterson. If you've gone to Louisville, you've seen the Watterson Trail or the Watterson Expressway. They worked for them. Uh, my father's father, I never met. I didn't have any pictures of him till much later. And uh, he was on the board for the Jefferson Town Colored School. 
and um, he was given a sum of money when Mr. Watterson died. And they were just neat people because basically they believed that whatever you needed to do, you could do. Um, as I said, the system was segregated, so yes, there is a um, park at the end of the road, but we were not allowed to go. There was a dairy, and uh, we were not allowed to be out when the farmers were out because farmers, which were typically white, were not viewed as individuals that were good to be around for little girls. I learned later what that significance was, and that was about the time that Emmett Till was killed. Um, we moved to Louisville uh, because when the segregation ended with Brown B. Lord, he couldn't keep his job. And so we moved to Louisville, and my dad got a job teaching for about two blinks of an eye. They saw him, and they decided they didn't have any jobs available. Uh, so he became a postman. And he stayed with his brother, and um, we stayed with my aunt until my parents brought her home. And um, at that particular time, all of his siblings were in Jefferson Town. And in Jefferson Town, my aunt, who was living in the family home, was a teacher, and uh, of course she never married. She taught home economics and sewing in Central High School. Her brother James uh, taught woodworking, and my uncle Milton, we called him Uncle Mick, was a uh, funeral home person and uh, the other two did a sundry types of jobs with factories. My grandmother, I don't remember. Since that time, I have worked with a woman by the name of uh, Rita Jones, who has written several books dealing with uh, African-American communities for the Filson Club there in Louisville. And I've had the opportunity to share uh, that information in her book. And considering we have what my dad would call people who like to keep stuff. Um, we have given the Jefferson Town Museum many of the pictures and the documents and so forth, mainly because my husband says there's no place to keep it in the house. So in my family, education was important. They were all highly educated. And since there were only three of us, and there were no children, we spent a lot of time with our aunt and her brothers. And things that were sort of in the house, National Geographics. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my aunts was big on McCall, so we all had the McCall's magazine to cut out the paper. 
Um, my dad liked to fish, and uh, I would traipse behind him a lot. And uh, we enjoyed doing those types of things. And he had probably typical of that time period, because uh, he was born in 1918. My mom was born in, depending on when you ask her, sometimes <laughs> she would say it was 1916, sometimes 1917, sometimes 1918. But she never told the truth about her age. She was actually born in 1916. Um, and she taught home economics and seamstress sewing at Kentucky State, but when we got older, she went back to school and got a degree from Spalding in elementary education because, again, there weren't that many opportunities to teach in Louisville home economics and those types of things. Um, so they were pretty easy going. Uh, they were older, so they were determined that they would provide what they believed that we needed and some of the things we wanted. Uh, my dad, <laughs> my dad was a funny sort of fella. He wanted to make sure that we didn't see certain things as little girls. So um, he was in the fraternity, he was in Omega Sci-Fi, and um, when he would go out and see friends and so forth, we never really knew that he would drink. And some of his fraternity brothers have told me since he has passed, but he always kept a little flask, which I never saw the entire time. Uh, but he did. And he liked and enjoyed people. My mom was a lot shyer. Um, and in her family, my grandmother, um, Beatrice Rudder, she was originally from Tennessee. And um, what was typical at that particular time, if you were to go and get an education in Kentucky, education in Kentucky was only provided up until either the sixth grade or the eighth grade. And the state did not provide for education past that. And why is that? Well, if we go back to the history, there were no schools in many places open to blacks. And those that were, sometimes it was church groups that paid that available. You had to pay a certain amount of tax for those schools. And if the money got short, those individuals didn't get to go. Um, but that's just sort of the history. And I don't, when I say just, it's, you know, to really get into all of that, we'd be here for hours and mm -hmm. hours. Uh, but it is something that's important to understand and to be aware of. Secondly, at that particular time, you had the boys and you had, he was belief that you had liberal arts for everyone. If you were looking at um, Booker T. Washington, he believed in more of the vocational aspect. And so if there was a school for African Americans that had more of a vocational aspect because the expectation was you're gonna go get a job. Mm -hmm. And farming, working in a home, those types of things, those are skills that you needed to have. Some of that has changed. Um, 
and some of that is sort of not really thought of that positively. Partly because nobody is really teaching the history, so you'll find out if he teaches the history, it was positive. Um, one of the interesting things, though, was that as a kid, my dad had his agriculture books. And I call myself learning to write because I would try to write and duplicate what was in his agriculture books. Only bad thing was I was doing it in the book. <laughs> and we kept those books until probably two or three years after he died. And um, three little girls, you know, and we would get in the backyard when he was packing stuff together so he could farm. Now, he didn't do potatoes, he didn't do corn, but all these other things we would be out there helping him do. My mother would then can all of these things. And uh, at that particular time, we had a coal stove. So we weren't allowed to help fix the stoves, but we did try. So you mentioned you moved to Louisville. You yeah. were born there. When did you move there? How old were you? Uh, 55, 56. So about six years old? Five. Five or six? Five, because I went to started to school there. And that's <clears throat> that was when they were trying to decide where you were going to go to school. Uh, because the school that we were, would have gone to next door in Stanford, they closed. Could you tell me a bit about your schooling in Louisville when you were younger? Well, I went to what they called Henry Clay, and that was uh, an integrated school. And so I went to first grade. And then when we moved, which was the western part of Louisville, which had been an area that you had um, several situations. You had an area that had been uh, set up for individuals who were coming back from the military that they could buy homes. Um, and it was a little area where you had a lot of whites and the socioeconomics varied in that area. and. Uh, it was segregated, and so when we moved there, um, there were probably three families of African Americans. Our family, the people next door, the Prevets, and there were two of them, and they still have the, the daughter still has the home. And then the other part of it was most of the area was Catholic. Uh, and that church and that school still exist, uh, Christ the King. And so what we would often do is play with each other, cards, softball, we even tried playing touch football, and although my dad didn't think too much of that. Um, he didn't think little girls should be doing that. And my neighbors on the other side of me were white and Catholic. And so we just played. You know, there wasn't a lot of traffic, so we'd get out in the street, play, Softball, kickball. Usually, by the time it got dark, you know, mom and dad would come out and say, you "Gotta get off the street," and you. Then we'd go from one house to the other on the front porch, playing with each other. Um, Louisville has been segregated for quite some time, and um, 
at the time that we moved, we had a family of, which was the Bradens, and I subsequently went to high school with the son, Jimmy Braden. Their parents were thought to be communist, but they weren't. But they did have very activist activities, and that meant that they sold a house to a black family, and they tried to burn the house down. The family, the house got tried to be burnt down. Um, but we didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to that because we were just kids, and uh, the Becks at the end of the block, there were ten of them. And so, you know, we all just got out and ran and played, and um, therefore they went to the Catholic schools. And there were no Catholic schools that the blacks could attend in that area. So we just played. Um, when we moved to Louisville, it was a time where you knew that there was prejudice and so forth, but there was so much transition in relocating where people were living. And in that area, there was a lot of um, issues around race, where you could go, what you could do. Um, and for a lot of people, there was like a, a, an area, there was downtown, older homes where more of the professionals lived, and then in another area where other professionals live. And uh, so it was not only segregated by race, but segregated by social class and in many ways it still is. Um, so we just sort of grew up doing that and um, active in the church. Um, my aunt, my mother's baby sister, was married to a minister and uh, he was a nationally and internationally recognized minister. And what was his name? Reverend D. E. King. He was originally from outside of Memphis, but his real name is Deering King, <laughs> but nobody ever called him that. Um, and he was probably 17 years older than my aunt, and therefore we had, had two cousins that were male, and they had a younger sister who was female. And at this particular time, my cousin Darren is the only one still alive. Uh, and he was a musician. He went to Western Kentucky, ran track, and did the hurdles. And on any kind of instrument he could get himself on. And because we all played with each other, after church, we would go into the main sanctuary and get on the piano or the organ. And my uncle would come in and remind us that he didn't necessarily like the type of music that we were playing because he was old school. And his brother, Michael, played by ear. So that was usually what we did between the first service in the afternoon service. So all of those kinds of things are what we did. Um, my dad was Methodist, my mom was Baptist, and so he went to his church. Um, and then usually once or twice a month, we on a Sunday would go out to my aunt's house and uh, we would spend time with our uncles and my one uncle James, who was the teacher, 
his wife had nephews and nieces that we played with as well. Now they tended to be 10 and 15 years older, but we were the kids, so we, you know. Uh, I was in the debate club. I liked chemistry, and uh, I learned a lot about the difference in races, um, primarily because when our neighbors, the Kaisers, moved, they didn't want anybody to know they had been living in the West End or having neighbors that were black. How did I know? They came to visit one time, and uh, they was explain were explaining that, and we were like, "Why? What's?" Um, my dad was in the military, and one of his best friends married a Japanese lady. So we always had pictures of them and uh, things of that nature, because. Up until the time he died, they connected back and forth always. My mom's brother went to Purdue and was one of the first to go to Purdue as an African American. He was also one of the first to go into the Marines. And then he decided that he wouldn't do that anymore. But. He wanted to be an attorney, and at 61, he got his law degree and was practicing. Her two sisters, Dorothy and Evelyn, went to Dillard. And since mom was the oldest, she stayed out a year, made some money, and that's when she went to Kentucky State. Uh, we were go to Kentucky State on a regular basis, commencements, games, and when they had opportunity to do things. And they always had activities. And sometimes my aunt would go because she was a 1918 graduate from Kentucky State. So we spent a lot of our time with adults. So both your parents went to Kentucky State, mm -hmm. so that would make you a second generation college student? Yes. All right. Was it expected that you would go to college after you graduated high school? Did your family expect you to? There was no question. No question. That was a given. Um, um, did you ever consider going to Kentucky State? Not really, because my sister is a year behind me, and it was if you've not had the understanding of an HBCU, the culture there was such that dress, activities, and so forth cost money. And a lot of the people I knew that went to HBCUs had relatives who also had gone, and so they were able to get scholarships and they did those types of things. Well, my dad's position was, okay, you're coming out, in 68, your sister's coming out the next year. We need to sort of figure out where you're going and how mm -hmm. you're going to do this and how we're going to pay for all of this. And my sister, um, she scored better on the SATs than I did, but she didn't want to leave the state. I couldn't wait to get out of the state. And I really wanted to go to um, an Ivy League. And when we looked at the prices, Daddy was going, oh, because it was it was a given, you know, it was no question. Mm -hmm. And my youngest sister is five years younger than I am, so it was like, you're going, you know. It's just a matter of what, where, and how. And just for clarification, can you tell me what HBCU stands for? Historically Black 
university, or college or universities. All right. So why did you choose Ball State to attend? I had gotten to know one of my mom's friends who was a teacher, and she taught special education. And I had plopped around over there when she was doing her special education classes. And I wanted to do special education. And when I went and was talking to Mrs. Clark, she would indicate that I needed to figure out whether I wanted to do educable or trainable. And she was concerned that some of the trainables are really big kids that I probably would be better off doing educable. And so one of the things that we used to do all the time was go to the library. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I went to the library and found a book about schools. And Ball State was one that was listed. And so I said, well, it's close enough, so I'll try to do that. And as a, going back, as a activity, the three houses, our house, the Kaisers, and the Privets, on a Thursday, regularly, we would all troops to the library, get the books out that we wanted, and come home. And then we would troops back on the next, return them, and bring them back home. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you begin to find out what and what. And so I decided to apply. Didn't know a thing about Ball State. Had never seen a Ball State. Didn't know anybody who'd ever been to Ball State. But one of the women that my mom grew up with lived in Indianapolis. And Ms. McCampbell said, well, her daughter, Larman was getting married to a gentleman whose name was Buckner, who was also in Indianapolis. And his brother had gone to Ball State. And he had a girlfriend who was at Ball State. So she fixed it up where Janice Thomas would write me and tell me all about Ball State. And so she did. I wrote back, and we conversed, and I decided to go. The other thing was, I did not want to go to a school where everybody knew me. I wanted the opportunity to try on different hats. Because I was basically fairly shy, and I thought I didn't want to be around other people who would set up who they thought I was. And when you see HBCUs, my dad and my mom, you know, their friends were not from the same city, the same state. You know, there may have been someone from Arkansas, or New Jersey, and all of these different places. So I thought this is the way you do it because then you get to meet all these different people with different expectations and interests and all of these things. That was not Ball State, but that's what I thought I would be getting. And so I made the application, and they gave me college work study. And I was like, oh, okay. And I came to Ball State. So when you were writing to Janet, what were some of the things she told you to expect about Ball State? Well. There's no place in Muncie or Ball State that you can get your hair done. Uh, the ratio of guys to girls was more like four to five. So four to five girls for every one man. If you came, uh, faculty, you know, they were okay, but they weren't going to really do much to really push you. Uh, you were going to spend a lot of time in, in Muncie. Um, that's where the social t activities were. Uh, she was a sorority. She was a 
aka, and that would be something you could do. And there were the deltas. Those are the only two black sororities that we had. Don't even think about what white folks will do because they will let you and invite you, but no, it's, that's not going to happen. Uh, and these are some of the people that you will get to meet, and most of them will be from Indianapolis or Gary. So it's like, okay. You were mentioning that you kind of had an expectation from um, visiting Kentucky State with your parents and knowing about historically black universities. How was Ball State different from your expectation once you actually got here? Like what were the things you noticed were different? Well, when I went to orientation, there was only one other person that was black. They had uh, country music. Um, <laughs> they felt like, you know, I needed to come and be a part of what they were doing, and I didn't have an interest in doing any of that. Um, and there were no staff, or no, no one there that looked like me made an effort to interact with me, uh, showed any interest in anything that I might have wanted to know. I was just sort of out there on my own. So that's why I brought a book. Um, when I came to campus, there was a large population. So in the residence hall, we had bunk beds. So you had two beds and a bunk bed. And uh, we had to share the, the dresser drawers. There wasn't enough for And uh, what else? There was not much interaction between blacks and whites. Um, that's an understatement in some ways. In the residence hall, um, it wasn't much to see, um, and you didn't really know where you were going to be or who was going to be your roommates or anything like that, which is something that I thought somebody would have, you know, well, such and such. Um, social, if blacks didn't do it for themselves, it didn't happen. and. The university wasn't really that concerned about it. Uh, things that happened in the residence halls were things that I would have never thought would happen. Um, we had dorm mothers in HBCUs. You had a system where they had to sign out and sign in. And if your parents didn't give you permission to do those things, you weren't doing them. I don't think I saw our resident hall director more than once or twice. And she had a dog. And she would walk that dog in the house. And I don't do dogs. <laughs> but she thought it was just fine for her to move to her little dog as a little spent cocker spaniel. Um, there was no discussion of what was available socially. Um, they had it set up where if the black females there were one set of blacks on each floor. Which made no sense to me. Um, the roommate that I had was from Columbus. Was that Columbus, Indiana or Columbus, Ohio? Columbus, Indiana. 
and she had a boyfriend, and she thought he was God's gift to whoever. But she had this habit of if she wanted something out of her out of the room, she would send somebody, whoever she was talking with, to come into the room and come and get whatever it was. Which did not go over well with me because I didn't know who these people were she was sending to the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, she didn't understand why I had a problem with that. And if we were on campus, she never spoke to me. She made no acknowledgement that I was there. She could pass me just like from here to here. And was your roommate another African-American student? No. She was white? Yes. Okay. And did you live in the dorms all four years you were no. here? No. No? Did you move off campus? I moved off campus. Uh, the first year, um, the university made a selection. Second year, there was another f girl who was from Richmond, and she was in the same boat. She didn't know anybody or anything, but there were some other girls from Richmond, and so they said, you don't have a roommate. Why don't you all get together and be roommates? So we said hello, and we said, yeah, we'll be roommates. We didn't know each other from Adam. And so we were roommates. Pat and I were roommates our sophomore year and our junior year. I tried to talk her into moving off campus, but her brothers were opposed to that, so she stayed on campus. So I was like in DeMott, and then I moved out, what was it? Out there on the other side of uh, Lafayette, La Follette. Uh, so we stayed there for those two years, and then I decided no, I, I got to get off campus. Um, although there were some girls there that I really enjoyed being with. Uh, one was, uh, her name was, we called her Jan Stretch Diggins. She was from Fort Wayne. I think, I don't remember. But she was really tall, she was a Spanish major, and she lived in a town that had like a seafood place. And so she would work there on weekends sometimes in the summer. And uh, because she worked there, she would bring well, things back like Lobster, and when the one time she and some of the other girls they had the lobster, and we were walking it down the hall before she cooked it. And I didn't know a thing about lobster, but it, it was it was fun, you know. Um, they also would do things like take the water, throw it down the hallway, and go sliding. So. It, it changed a little bit, um, and so that was a good part of it because you got to know people for some different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And part of that was the kind of things that I got involved in because I worked at special programs, and I did that the first year, which was, it was down in the basement of the student center. Then we got the special programs house. Um, and so that gave you an opportunity to meet and interact with a lot of different people. In that first process of doing that, I got to meet Thelma Hyatt. Ms. Hyatt was head of the housing program, and she had gotten hurt uh, on, at the airport, and then she became director of the international program. And I used to spend a lot of time over there, and I interacted with her, visited with her, and shared with her till the day she died. Um, and the things that was important because there wasn't any African American women to say anything about what to think about and how and so forth. 
But Hyatt was good at it. You know, I can remember asking, well, why didn't you get married? And she said, well, I was thinking about it, but then I realized I didn't want to have to wake up every morning looking at him. So I was like, oh, okay. And so sometimes when I'd come up here for meetings, I'd stay with her. Sometimes just different kinds of things. She lived in the farmhouse that her parents had had. And they had had a, uh, like a general, general store kind of thing. That's not too far outside of Munson. And she stayed there and she had the farm and then she gave the farm to her niece and she lived not too far from the campus. Uh, so as far as activities and things, there were two kinds of places, you know, me, my world, in terms of who was here that were of color, and that was the family. And then there were the faculty and the other individuals I got to know through activities, like being with the uh, admissions and credits. And you come up early and you go over the records and you would decide whether a student got to stay in school or they would send them home. And it was always interesting because you had to be concerned about confidentiality and you know, you might see somebody and you know that they won't be here uh, and things like that. So that was always interesting, and especially when they were telling, oh, I think I'm gonna sit out and work this semester. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, other differences was that you really didn't have a lot of interaction with the faculty. Um, and that's something that you knew in an HPC, you know, the faculty lived around the campus, they knew you, they may have known your parents, and there was this interaction and so forth, and, you know, they, they talked to you even when you were little, you know, oh, you do that. And there were a lot of conversations where they would say, you know, you need to think about this. I can't think of any time that I had any kind of conversation with a faculty in a classroom. Uh, I didn't like large classes. I didn't like early morning classes. Uh, early morning to me was 10 o'clock. That 7 o'clock class, uh, no. Uh, the notion that I had to put on a skirt to go to lunch. You, know, you could have blue jeans or whatever for breakfast, but you had to have a skirt on for lunch. So you had to go run to the room, and at that time you had to wrap around. So you'd wrap around, roll your blue jeans up, and go in. And that was just an expectation that you had to wear a skirt to lunch? That was the rule. That was the rule. You wouldn't be allowed no. in? No. And see, you didn't mind that at dinner because you could come back and you weren't going to be coming from class. But mm -hmm. coming from class, I'm going to put on a, no, mm -mm. no. Nah. So they didn't have some of those rules. Um, majority of people that I knew and experienced at uh, HBC, they worked. I worked in the school. Here, I didn't really see any of the white students working. They may have, you know, and what I know now is that some of them were working in the offices and doing other things, but I didn't know a way of distinguishing them from somebody else. Um, and more of them were from different places. But most of them were from right around this area because I was surprised that there wasn't anyone from Clarksville, 
New Albany, you know, the southern part, that was not that many there. And uh, the other thing that was a difference is some of the comments that were made by the other females in the uh, residence halls. You know, uh, I made a point of some things I wrote down. Um, we had a young lady, she was a freshman, and we were in the hall going to the kitchenette to get something to cook because we didn't have meals in the residence hall on Friday evenings. And she wanted to know something. We said, well, what do you want to know? She says, do y'all have tails? Excuse me? Well, I, 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 I don't mean to, you know, she apologized. You know, she clearly didn't know, and she wanted to know if we had tails, and could we show her? Wow. Now, coming from Louisville, you know, no, I'm... That was something that you know, I may have heard of, but that wasn't a reality. Now, the funny part was, one of the others got in, said some mm, uh, ugly things back to her, but she subsequently started running with blacks, mostly black males. Um, so it was like, hmm. But that was something that I knew I would never have seen or heard um, between the Ball State and here. Um, some of the kinds of things that happen out here, you know, we had <laughs> the basketball game. And there were at least three guys that played basketball. The coach would never let all three of them play at the same time. Which we thought was weird. There was a walkout. It's like, hmm. Uh, when you were to Kentucky State, they had the biggest parade, social activities on the campus. Didn't see that here. Uh, social activities were not something that all states seemed to be concerned about when it came to the blacks. Um, there was a gentleman who worked in the alumni Ernie, and he was talking, and we were all talking, and he was like, well, what did you all do for homecoming? Because, you know, we never saw you at homecoming. <laughs> we said, well, we knew what you all were doing. And so he was like, well, what did you do? I said, we had our own homecoming. Uh, most of us weren't a whole lot of money, so the Roberts Hotel <laughs> downtown. Uh, so there were some other places they would do it. And it was either the fraternity or the sororities that got together, and that's what you did. And then there's the question, well, how did you get there? Well, there was one or two guys that were on campus who had cars, and they would drive from one dorm to the next to pick up young ladies who wanted to go to the events on campus. And since we had to be back in by 12, and the parties didn't end until after 12, then you would end up finding somebody who lived off campus and there'd be eight or nine young ladies all parked in wherever they were living till you could get in at eight o'clock in the morning. You mentioned that there was a walkout on campus. Oh, there were several of those. Um, were you referring to one in particular, or? It was one of the f uh, football game, uh, basketball games. Uh, there was an incident, and some of the 
uh, related to the basketball players, and they, they walked out. And that was when you were a student here? Mm -hmm. Were you there for the walkout, or? I came in a little late, but yeah, I saw him walk. And what was your reaction to that? Good. Good? Why'd you feel that way? <sighs> Why would you limit three of your best players being on the floor all at one time? And since I knew those guys, it's like, what's, what, what is the problem? And there had been a walkout before I got here, and they walked out of Emmons Auditorium. Uh, and you had to, well, I shouldn't say that. You wouldn't know because during that time frame, you had a lot of racial issues on different campuses. You had the Vietnam, Vietnam War issues came and dealt with on the campus. You know, um, Ohio State, and the kids got killed. Kent State in Ohio. Kent State. Yeah, in Ohio. Yeah, well, Ohio State and some of the others as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so when those things happened, yeah, I walked out. I sat on, out in front of the arts building, and uh, part of that was due to the fact that there was a young man that I grew up with who didn't come home. And I never really saw why we were fighting that war, which is a different conversation because my husband was in the war. Uh, but, yeah, you know, there were lots of things like that. And being president of the Black Student Union, it's like, why are we having to be treated differently? Why can't you understand and give us the same respect that you give everybody else? You know, and... Uh, we did have some people that were good about that. Dr. Bur Dr. Pruis, he had an open door policy. So, yeah, I'd trip over there and say, you know, da 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 da, why this and so forth. Um, but you also had, at that time when they first opened up the special programs, you had this notion, and it was not just Ball State that had this particular approach. But you might have a program for students of color. And since we didn't really have uh, Native Americans or Hispanics in any great numbers, you would expect certain things to be available. Well, when they first opened it, it was in the basement. He had a phone and a desk, no staff. A couple of us are students, and there was not the support or the resources to make it a positive place for these groups of students. Right. As a member of those groups of students, then what did you guys do for social activities or organizations on campus if the university didn't really provide them for you? Well, we would reserve 311 and get one of the guys to bring the music and we would have a little party. And we made sure that we cleaned it up, set it up, because my friend Danny uh, Henderson, uh, who I'm still close friends with, and we'd go. We'd fix it and do it and, and then when it was time to go, we go. Did you say it was called 311? That's the room number. Where's the room? Student Center. Student Center, room 311. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so 
there was no charge. You could dance, you could talk, you could have a good time, and then you leave. And if there's somebody said, well, we're going to have an after set, which is somebody's apartment off campus, you try to hook up so you could do that. Or we would walk back from the student center out to the duck pond. Because, you know, at least sit out there and just, mm hmm and then you mentioned that there were um, black fraternities and sororities. Mm -hmm. Were those a common thing for people to join when they came here? They were. Uh, the interesting thing was that uh, it was not limited to African Americans. There were whites that joined us, particularly in the sororities. And uh, that was not the case down Fraternity Row. Uh, the, Sororities had suites, it's like a little room, probably not bigger than this, uh, in the residence halls, mm -hmm. and the sororities would have that space for their activities. And if you're not in that group, otherwise, one of the things we would do, oftentimes when I was in Demont, we would all get together. The, there was what about eight of us. And they had brothers and others who were here on campus too. We'd all come over there. We might watch TV. We might play badminton or something, or whatever, and just talk. And that was the social life for us. Uh, it was not anything spectacular, but when you talk to others who were in that time frame and other institutions, particularly other PWIs, we were all doing the same thing. We were all having the same sets of issues and we were all like, having the same kinds of reactions and treatments by the schools. And what does PWI stand for? Predominantly white institutions. Right. And were you a member of any of nope. the authorities? Why or why, or why not? Or, oh my gosh, why weren't you a part? Uh, of Primarily because I got in involved in the other things like student activities, uh, student government, and being involved in the uh, Black Student Union. Um, that just was not my cup of tea. Uh, so you I thought about it, but... Mm. So you were in the Black Student Union? Yes, I was secretary treasurer and for two years I was president and the biggest thing with that was that the guys thought it was horrible for a female to be the president. So I was president and the vice president was a black male from Cleveland who was a Kappa. And so what I did was I decided to change it so that we were co-chairs. And that made the guys easier to deal with. Now, when he and I had bumped heads because he wanted to be chair. And I was like, no, you'd co-chair. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to him about this when he was here this last summer at the reunion and we were talking about, yeah, you know, I did that on purpose because they didn't want a female to be head. They didn't think a woman should be head. And I'm like, why not? I got elected. Now, if I have to do something, I'll make a, <clears throat> I'll make a co so we can do what we need to do to go forward. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've asked you this, but were you a were you a member of this organization your entire time here at Ball State? With the Black Student Union? Yes. Yes. And what years were that? Like, when did you come to Ball State? I came to Ball State in 68. I graduated undergrad 72. I graduated 74 with a master's. Then I, no, 73. Then I worked here for uh, a year in uh, special programs. What other student organizations besides the Black Student Union were you a part of? Well, 
I was a student representative for on the um, admissions and credits because they had a, a place for students. So the whole government kind of piece I did. Uh, but there was enough to do to keep me busy just doing that. And you were a part of the first Miss Black Ball State pageant, right, or contest. Mm -hmm. How did you come to be involved with that contest? Well, it was something that was uh, decided upon through the special programs. And uh, I figured, why not? And what year was that? That I don't remember. I had to look at something. That's a piece of paper I didn't bring. Uh, but you've got that somewhere. It would have been... It would have been 1970. 1971. I think it was my junior year. Yeah, 71. Um, but the special programs was the place for African-American students. That's where we had activities, we had programs, um, we had programs because we found that some of our students, you know, didn't have a whole lot of money, so we served lunch. Um, we redid the basement so you could just go and hang out. Um, we did a program with uh, makeup and so forth, and we did that. Uh, we had a tea, and we were very excited because Dr. Proust came, and he was there. And uh, we have pictures of him. We did other activities because why not? I mean, there, there was no attempt to include us in things, so we made our own. Now, the thing to remember, and I can't really, can't, you don't, I'm not going to remember. Um, those types of activities were things that individuals had done over time. We didn't have any expectations that the university was going to do anything. You know, before we had uh, an alumni group, alumni from Muncie, in Muncie, would have activities for those who are coming back for a football game or for homecoming. And that's sort of where I got the idea, you know, this is what you need to do because this is what I saw. Uh, so we, we did those things. Um, yes. If you were having a Miss Ball State, you know, if you were a sorority, yeah, you could you could send somebody as a as a candidate, but you knew that that was not going to happen. So we did our own. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that it was not something unique to Ball State. It was happening nationwide because originally for a person of color to get an education they had to go to an HBCU and so that was the culture so when those individuals moved out of that arena that's what they brought with them to say this is what I think it should be and if they had a parent or a friend or that's the culture, those are the activities, that's the arena in which they saw. And so they made it there for themselves. What would you say that the reaction to the, or the first contest on campus then was from the university? If it's being brought to this um, campus, like what was the reaction generally, do you think, to Miss Black Ball State? They didn't, they, they paid no attention. It was not even within their thought process. Now, 
that's not to say that there might not have been someone who said why, but did, did, as long as it didn't cost them money, didn't involve anything, they could have cared less. And then you were the first runner-up the second year you competed in it. How did that feel to be first runner-up in that contest? Or how did you become first runner-up? Well, we had judges. We had activities. You had us answered questions. We pretty much set it up much like you would see if you were doing Miss Balls, uh, Miss America, or something like that. Um, I managed to do it in a lot of ways that were pretty non-traditional. I had a jumpsuit on. I didn't wear shoes. I had written a poem that was very much involved in what was taking place on campus in the world right then. And uh, I was sitting on the floor, but I didn't have a big problem with that other than one of the judges said that I wasn't black enough. And why, why did he say that? She said it. She said it. Because within black culture, particularly based on a lot of things that took place in slavery and so forth, people are judged by the color of their skin. And um, I wasn't dark, dark, which blew me away. It was like, because I've never been around where the color of my skin was an issue. Am I bright enough in terms of intelligence? Am I articulate? Yeah, you, you need to, that's what you're going to be judged on. Uh, so that just, it's like, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. I, knew, I, I eventually understood it, but it's, to this day, it's still something that within the culture comes up. We just had the latest pageant this past month on campus, mm -hmm. but now it's called the Unity Pageant. And it includes, it's a, that pageant is part of Unity Week, which is a week in February where on campus we celebrate um, all different ethnicities. It's promote diversity. So I know we have people from um, the Latino Student Organization, the Asian Student Association, and then the Black Student Association. They all are a part of that now. So it's grown to be a more inclusive pageant for people of color. What is your reaction to that? Do you think that's a good thing that that progressed or? I don't see where there should be any issue of it. I mean, if you're looking at the history of how those things developed and who was in the community, you know, there would not have been individuals who would have been able to do the diversity piece. Um, so, I, no, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, it just, I do understand that from an institutional standpoint, that makes it easier for the, particularly PWI, to include all groups and I don't have to single out one or as you would say, you know, if I got five dollars and I've got Ten groups who fit into this diversity piece, as opposed to giving each one of them a dollar, or coming up with the ten dollars that they use for the larger piece, I can just say it's a unity group, and here's the ten dollars, and I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. From a diversity standpoint, and 
having been the director of the Multicultural Center at Ball, at uh, U of L. That's a fine thing to do. It may not make the students happy. It may not make uh, a lot of sense in terms of budget, because at no time will they increase the budget. Okay. You now have to look at the fact that when we start talking about diversity, you can't come up with a person that is of diversity. You've got lots and lots of different groups, and they all want to be apart and addressed. Unfortunately, most institutions, higher ed institutions, aren't interested in trying to come up with that additional money because they'd rather put it on research, sports, other aspects. So if they can put it all in one little place and get everybody happy and nobody be able to say this and this, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to backtrack to mm -hmm. why you said you came to Ball State. You said you wanted to major in special education. Is that what your official major was then when you started at Ball State? No. It was elementary education because I didn't want to be in special ed because Ball State did not have the delineation between trainables and educables. So I was like, okay. And um, the one time I did go to advising, they said, well, we don't do that. Uh, this is what you can get, and this is what we have. So I was like, okay, I'll just do, special, I'll just do the elementary education. And generally, what kind of student were you, would you say, were you? Uh, Towards the end, I would say I was a B student, depending on the subject matter. Uh, I found that I liked certain subjects better than others. Wasn't crazy about the math. However, we had five courses of math. One of those courses was how to teach math. And I enjoyed that because you needed to be able to teach a subject regardless of what the individual's ability level was. And so in the teaching, they said, you now have to be able to teach it from this level, this level, or this level. That, to me, was good. And that was something that I remembered um, Ms. Clark saying, you know, you had, if you're going to teach math, and this is the major concept, you've got to be able to break that down so that you can get this kid, this kid, this kid, and they all can learn it, but you're going to have to teach it differently. And was Ms. Clark your professor for that course? That was the teacher. It was my mom's friend who was in... Special education. Yeah. Okay. So what was your initial goal then when you graduated? Like what kind of job do you want to use with your degree? Uh, when I graduated, I graduated with the elementary education and at that point I decided I was going to go into student affairs at the college level. And I looked at teaching but I found it rather ridiculous that if I took a job in Richmond, Indiana, I'd make more money than if I worked as a teacher in Indianapolis. Why is that? I have no idea. <laughs> that was the pay scale. And I thought that was about as ridiculous as a day is long. And um, at that particular time, I was work, still working at the, multi, at the special programs. And Bob Cody suggested, why don't you do this? 
because that's what I've been doing. And uh, I decided that's the route I would go. And we knew, based on what was going on, if you got a job in the college of arena, there were two areas that you knew that you would always have a job, admissions and financial aid. And so I got my degree in student affairs. All right, so you graduated with your undergraduate degree in 1972, and then you went to graduate school here at Ball State also. Mm -hmm. Why did you go to Ball State for graduate school? Why not? Was it just out of convenience then? No. That's what I had been doing. So why would I pick up and go someplace else? No. This is where I grew. This is where I had my interest. These are the kinds of issues that I was dealing with. And I liked what I was doing. And so the Vice President for Student Affairs, Byron, was a big individual in that whole field. So I went to one of the conferences and talked to this one, talked to this one, saw what you could do, how you could do it. And I got a job, University of Texas at Austin, and I was working with students of color, Native Americans, Hispanics, and Blacks. And so there's where we went from there. Was your overall experience as a graduate student here at Ball State different than your experience as an undergraduate student? Oh, heck yes. How is it different? Uh, the amount of work that was available, I taught a class with what we called DACEP, Directed Admissions, where we brought in students during the winter quarter whose scores were not as strong, and we helped them prepare so that they could be able to go further. And oftentimes, individuals will hear a term like that, and they say, oh, those are individuals of color. No, they were white kids. We had a kid from Alaska who was a Native American. We had all kinds of different individuals. We had some athletes. So they had some weaknesses that we were trying to prepare them so when they get some of the regular courses, they would be able to do well and go forward. So I taught a class. And then you graduated from graduate school in 1973, and then you spent a year working at Ball State, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, what job did you have here? Where did you work? I was working in special programs. Mm -hmm. uh, the individual who was the education person was on maternity leave, so I took her job for the year. and. Uh, when I did that, I worked with the library, I counseled students, I talked to class, we did programming, and anything else Dr. Foster or Cody said we needed to do. And um, what was your experience like as an employee at Ball State in comparison to your experiences as a student here at Ball State? Not a whole lot different, because I was working primarily with the same groups of individuals. I learned a lot about the politics that were going on, and who got what and how and so forth. Um, and a lot of that I got through talking with um, Thelma Hyatt or Dean Wickham. Um, but that they were so closely related that they weren't different, different, because you're still working with the same types of students, you're dealing with the same sets of issues, um, and there were things that just, you know, didn't make a whole lot of difference when you looked at them. You know, 
Ball State still had a small number of students of color and even fewer who graduated. Um, we had students who lived in Muncie, but when you pulled up their records that said they lived and commuted from New York. And you're like, huh? Okay, you, now you know that that's, so where are they? How do you find them? What do they need? Then what do we do? Um, do you know Dr. Mylon Braun, is it? Mylon Brown. Brown? Yes. Yes. Um, how, what was your relationship? I met him uh, when I was graduate school. He had been in graduate school. He had come here. He comes back regularly to the uh, reunions. Uh, He's a lot of fun. He's very bright. And he is someone that helps you put the threads together to understand what it's like to be an African American in this country and with these attitudes and how to deal with that. So one of the things that you'll hear him talk about is uh, this stress that comes in with dealing with prejudice. The stress that happens when you are a student of color and you've been the top of your class and you walk into a classroom and the faculty is saying, you're not quite qualified to be here. And how do you cope? What do you do to keep going? Um, and he does this research. You know, um, research, when I did my dissertation, the research we see says if you want to see a student succeed, if they are of color, they're much more likely to succeed through an HBCU if they're a male than if they are at a PWI. Is that the same or different for females? It's for different. We have a tendency to do better in the PWI versus what a male could do. Now, why? Sometimes it's the prejudice how many options there are available, you know, if there are two big places for um, someone to take a leadership. It's easier for a female to do it of color than it is for a male because white men, black men, kind of thing. You know, uh, and how do you help students understand that without being angry, not knowing what to do with that? and the differences that we have within cultures. Right, so after you left Ball State, you said you got a job in Texas mm -hmm. in student life. Did you stay there for a while? Or? I was there for a little over a year. Um, we, had <laughs> we had a group of students who walked out, took over the administration building, and um, we've had to make some changes. So I then took a position in Nebraska. <laughs> and that was totally different. It's, Nebraska is one half of the campus is agriculture and farming. The other half is regular what you would think of and I walked in the residence halls and my colleagues were from New York, Chicago, Maine and one of the ladies there had been a Ball State grad 
That's interesting. <laughs> it was because she was a music major when she was here. Mm. And did you um, stay in student life positions? I stayed in student life until um, I came back to Louisville. And from there, I got out of education. And when I got out of education, I went into public situations. So I was head of the personnel department for the transit authority for Louisville. So I trained and tested. So that's where the testing and the training came in. Bus drivers and maintenance workers. And I was the first female to do that. And so my general manager had me go down to the maintenance area on a regular basis to help them figure out what and how. We use a testing system out of uh, University of Chicago to test the bus drivers and uh, working with the board and I loved it because <laughs> the typical person at the bus driving were white men who had been farmers and so they liked to get their schedules so that they could come in at four o'clock in the morning and drive and be off by two. And if the weather was bad, they were sick. And sometimes there was one guy in particular, and a lot of them from southern Indiana, he would always be sick for January, February, and March. But his rationale was, I can't have an accident in the snow if I'm not driving. So it gave you a, a different sort of look. Then I went to the city, and I was in personnel and training, and that is very different because it's political. So when you get a new mayor, unless you are connected with the right political stuff, and when I got hired, I was particularly hired because I was non-political. So when the new person came in, they went to political, and then that's when I went back to the university. And back to the university, do you mean that you went there as a student or as an I employee? went there as a staff person. As a staff person. You also, though, got um, another master's degree from the University of Louisville, correct? Yes. What was that in? What was the degree in? That was in uh, trying to remember what, what the actual name was. Actually, what they did was when I went back, they felt like I needed some additional courses for the PhD. And I basically went into the counseling and personnel piece of higher education. But typically at UofL, those individuals are individuals who are teaching, who want to be principals and so forth. So I did what I needed to do there and then I went into the PhD program. And when did you get your PhD? 2008, 2009. And was it in the same area then, for the most part, same name? Mm -hmm. If you weren't going to then end up being a principal like some of the other people, what was your end goal? What did you want to do with the other I wanted period? to be faculty. You wanted to be faculty? In what capacity? Like what, what well, duties did you want to be in charge of? In being faculty, I wanted to teach people how to work better with students of color because the program that I was working in, basically we were working with students of color who 
were first generation college and other students who were first generation college and making sure that they had the skill sets that they needed to go forward. And since I also did the faculty mentoring program for that group, so that faculty would know how to work with students because a lot of times in an institution like U of L, with a law school, with medical school, they don't necessarily know how to interact with students because they sort of think, okay, students should be able to come in, learn the material, and go. And the only way I'm going to interact with them is through a lecture. And a lot of students don't learn well that way. So we did the programming and all of that to help them be better teachers. How would you say that your experience at the University of Louisville as a student in your master's and doctoral programs and as an employee was different than your experience at Ball State? Or were they similar? They were different in that um, I was in Louisville. I knew Louisville. I'm f so I knew a lot more about what to expect, what uh, issues the students might be experiencing. Um, I became the director of the Multicultural Center when they opened it, and it was different in that the dean for student affairs specifically asked me to take this responsibility. And why were you asked specifically? I could say that I think he thought I was a good person to have in there. Uh, and partly also because I had been working with uh, the Crane House, which is a Asian program, and I had worked with the international students. So this gave me some insights. Uh, I'd been doing a lot of work with uh, issues around race, discrimination, and those types of things because one of the things that I did when I was with the city is I was a special assistant to the affirmative action officer and how you write policies, what you need to do, what kind of issues and things of that nature. And so when I did that, they all sort of pulled together and uh, the Crane House is uh, primarily different Asian communities. So in Louisville, we've got Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian, Chinese, Japanese. Because of the medical school, you have a large Asian population, Korean. Uh, so we would do a Asian program every year in connection with the museum. And so that sort of gave me the focus that they thought I could be teachable enough to get some other things done. And um, I did that. And uh, worked worked very well, and I still have interactions with the Crane House and the woman who created that program uh, and is now 92 and she is still very, very active and I love her dearly. And do you still work for the University of Louisville? I am now retired. When did you retire? I retired Three years ago. Three years ago. And why did you end up going back to Kentucky and back to Louisville? Was there any reason, or is that just where you ended up? Well, my parents were there, 
and in between uh, looking for another position, my dad said, well, why don't you look here? And I was like, well, I guess I can. So it wasn't something that I said, I'm going to go back to Louisville. It was like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm coming home, see my dad, see my mom, see the family. And he said, like, well, why don't you look here? So I did, and I did. All right, the last topic I'd like to talk to you about, I think, is really, um, sp like, specific to this project as a whole, because I want to talk about the Ball State Black Alumni Constituent Society. What is your relationship to that? Well, right now, I am a former president of that group, and I created, with the assistance of Hollis Hughes, who has um, been on the Board of Trustees for a number of years, uh, and a gentleman by the name of Dave Davis, who was a PhD and uh, admissions administrator and a uh, classmate of mine. And he is now deceased. Um, and I had come up here and it was like, Coming to this place after graduation, it was not like anything that I expected because I was expecting what I had seen when my mom and dad would go back to, Boston, to uh, Kentucky State. And <laughs> it was not that at all. It was just like, what is this? So I'm like, okay, well, why can't we just do that? And some of the individuals who lived in Muncie uh, had brought some of us back, and we had a good time. We laughed, we talked, and we shared what we remembered, who did what, and all of that. And so uh, I decided, you know, that would be something we should do. And uh, we needed some help, so I contacted Fred Cox, John Hall, Liz O'Dell, people that I knew that would probably not tell me no, they wouldn't participate. Uh, and um, talk to Cody, Bob Cody, because he was still here. And uh, we'd get together. And I was like, well, why can't we have a constituent group? And so Dave said, well, she went and talked to, to uh, Hollis, and Hollis said, well, you need to talk to this, 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 because the first reunion we did, I did it all myself. And so when I was driving up here, I said, oh, gee, I sent all those letters and stuff out. You know, we just, I just did it. Um, and so it was like, well, this is what we need. And so they said, well, you talk to us. Ed Shipley, and Ed's comment was, why? Why do you need a separate group? And uh, there was some resistance, but with Hollis being on the trustees, we didn't have a whole lot of resistance. <laughs> and um, so we did the first one, and, and then- What year was that? Uh, I don't remember, but I think Dr. Doyle probably has some copies of some brochures and some stuff of what we did in the time frame. Um, and so we did that first one, and then people said, well, we want to do this every year. Well, nobody wanted to hear it every year. And uh, we decided that we would do this, and we worked with uh, Shipley, and we wrote a constitution, and rewrote it, and sent it out to see when we wanted to have the uh, 
reunion, and one of the things that we knew that we needed to do was say, you know, we need to have people to participate. And so, you know, someone like Al Williams is like, Al, you and so I, I just started grabbing folks, and if they wanted to do it, we did it. And so that's how we sort of got started. And then I became president, and I did that for a number of years. And then when I came off of that, I was still a member as an ex officio. And then um, I made those trips at least once a month or once every two months. And then um, my sister asked me to take care of her daughter while she went to graduate school. Uh, she was a dance major. Uh, and so I did that. So when I did that, Rob and I decided that maybe uh, I needed to cut back on some of the things that I was doing because I was, you know, on the board for the Crane House. I was with the Boys and Girls Club, the Jazz Club. So a lot of things that I was doing, uh, as well as taking classes. So it's like, you can't do it all. What was the relationship with the society and the Ball State Alumni Association when it first started? There was no relationship. And why was that? Because we started without, just we started it. Um, the initial group was some of the Muncie alum. And then we said, okay, you know, well, we can do this. You know, we never asked them to do anything with us before, so we were going to do this, and that's what we did. And then when uh, Dave and Hollis said, well, particularly Hollis, said, that's what the alumni is for. That's what they should be doing. And their response was, well, why do we need to do this? What is this different? What's the necessity of it? And to me, that was stupid. Because if you've never been involved with us, you don't know anything about what we do, you had no interactions with us, you know, why? So what were some of your complaints then about the inclusion, like the relationship between black students and the Ball State Alumni Association before this society? There was no relationship. They never sent me anything. I never got a piece of paper or anything. So, and you know, I could turn around and look at the stuff my mom had and my dad had. So that's what I thought it should be. And if it wasn't, I'm gonna make sure we have it. You had Cody, you had Foster here, special programs, those kind of things that they have been doing. So. It was an issue. If it had not been for Hollis and Dave, you know, we probably would have never approached him because we were like, you know, if I can put it together with me in Louisville with Co why would I go and ask the alumni? They've never made any interaction towards me. So I think a lot of times people don't realize that if you're accustomed to having to do it yourself and doing what makes it work for you why would you do anything else? And would you say there's a relationship with the Alumni Association now? Or? Oh yeah, there is now. And what's that relationship like? Well, I think it is good in the sense that we have a history. Uh, we were able to get it simply to see and be a part of it. And one of the things that if you have a reunion, Ed would be right there playing cards, talking, and hanging out with the groups. Um, and so that was a positive. The issues now and some of the kind of changes, uh, Sue Taylor has been an absolute bombshell in terms of being difficult to work with. She thinks she knows what it's like to be black and what we need when we did, and that we should be following whatever she decides. And there's not been a individual 
who's been in the president's position, who's not had a headache with her. And is she a part of the Alumni Association? She is now the director. Okay. Uh, the person that was the best person to work with was Mark Urban. And why was that? Mark was willing to listen. He was willing to be involved and active. And uh, as he told me when we were trying to do this uh, reunion two years ago, his dad was a faculty member. He worked with the alumni and he respected our perspectives and when there was difficulty getting others to understand or provide that, he would be that person who could sort of do it. Uh, as I said to him, I said, well, you know, one of the things that I appreciated about him was he listened, he respected, and uh, he was willing to go to bat for us. Besides the reunions, what other things does the society do for black alumni? Well, I will tell you what we have done okay. because the things have changed. Uh, we have gone into the uh, Black Expo programs to help them recruit. Um, we have had other activities like coming up for the football games or other things like that uh, for the group to get together. We have done programs where we went to someplace like a Gary, because there's something about the distance between Gary and Muncie that a lot of times when they leave, they don't come back that often, that we've gone up there and done a program, or we've done the programs here in uh, Indianapolis. Uh, those things haven't been done as much um, because the university really wants to try to have a program that's based on the model they have for white folks. And do you think that's a good thing or a no. bad thing? No. Why isn't it a good thing? My culture, my experiences are not the same. What I'm looking for and what pulls me back which will get me to give you money, which is what you basically want, is not based on your culture, your values, and your perspective. And we recognize students who have succeeded and done certain things in terms of the programs. Uh, and if we can get them when they're young, young being their recent grads, before they, and under the leadership with Ed, U of L has duplicated, replicated what we've done here. Wow. Unfortunately, a lot of other politics and stuff, that's not what's happening and uh, as I said to you and I wasn't sure how you took this but at this point Sue has her own ideas about what it should be and it should be the way she sees it and not what's best for the program for individuals who look like me and have these experiences but see we could get some of the folks to come back they were graduates in the 50s. That's a different world. And if you don't understand that, and you don't support that and embrace that, it'll die. So what do you see as the future for the program, or what advice would you have for the program moving forward? Sue's not the person to lead the program. You need to look at a model much like what the HBCUs do. 
when you go back and they have a reunion or an activity like they have with Kentucky State, you will have alums bring back money with all kinds of activities, $20,000, $30,000 for one alumni chapter out of Texas, out of Indianapolis. That's what you need. And to need, do that, you have to understand the culture, the issues, and be willing to understand that there can be more than one way to do it. But that's not her. Before we close the interview, is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you would like people to know about your life, career, or experiences here at Ball State? Um, <laughs> I had a roommate, um, Gail Bush. Gail is from East Islip, New York, and uh, she was a great person to interact with, and uh, She made it possible to me to learn more about white folks. And we had a roommate. Her name was Carol. She was from outside of Indianapolis. And the funniest thing I've ever heard is she didn't know French fries did not come out of a bag. I didn't know people didn't know that french fries were potatoes. She says, no, did you cut them out of a bag and they're freezing? I was oh, like, my. oh my gosh. But at that particular time, when I came out, the economy was such that a lot of us did not have the opportunity to get positions that were the same that supported the degrees that they were getting. Um, and it is important that we look at higher education as a mechanism to prepare people to interact with a wide range of individuals and understand the cultural aspects that make us human beings. And if we don't do that and support that, we are in for a great deal of chaos. Is there anything more you'd like to say? No. Nope. No. Nope. All right. Well, then, on behalf of the Ball State University African American Oral History Project, I would like to sincerely thank you for your participation today. Thank you for having me.